My father was uh, gunned down by Bakersfield PD, a uh, 73-year-old suffering from dementia, early stages of dementia. He probably wasn't even doing anything, just taking his walk so he can try to rest. I ain't got nothing against the police, but this needs to stop against innocent people. Enough is enough already. Your hands, your hands. We have a 311, shots fired, shots fired. Policia! Manos! Manos! Oh, no. Manos! Hey. Drop the gun! Drop the gun! Do it now! Drop the gun! Oh, Luis, are you okay? You all oh, five men! Five men! Papa! Is he okay? He doesn't move! Colonialization, racial dominance, the notion that there is a, a superior race in the United States has everything to do with control of a particular population. When it comes to the criminal justice system, Latino stereotypes tend to focus on certain types of criminality. And these are long-standing historical narratives that have been created since at least the mid-1800s. Mexicans, Latin Americans generally, were looked at as an inferior race. That helped justify the conquest of half of Mexico by 1848. It certainly was part of what the United States designs on expanding westward were all about. When the U.S.-Mexican War ended in 1848 and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, one of the key provisions was that Mexicans living on now United States side would be able to choose U.S. citizenship if they wished and then to have their property rights maintained. But no matter what the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo said, many whites believed that they had won the war and Mexicans no longer had any claim or right to California. So they felt completely justified in posting notices that said all Mexicans all Latinos, Chileans, Peruvians, any other Spanish figures in the mines have 24 hours to leave, and if they didn't, they would uh, be killed. Anglo-Americans wanted access to Mexicans and indigenous people's land, and one of the principal ways to do that was to eliminate them, either by outright killings or by criminalizing them and making them outsiders in a community that they had long before actually dominated. In the middle of the 19th century, Mexicans who were extra-legally killed by lynch mobs or Texas Rangers or vigilantes, it's certainly in the thousands. One of the things that led to the Mexican lynchings being forgotten is that they divided uh, the victims into just two categories, black and white. And in that white category were Native Americans, Chinese, and more than anyone else, Mexicans. Making one group of humans to be separate and apart and lesser than is a project of racialization. The Spanish-American War, which resulted in the acquisition of a handful of territories within the Caribbean Sea and also in the Pacific Islands, Puerto Rico especially became a, a target for this acquisition. Puerto Ricans are 
second largest population in the United States today of Latinos. And that's a population that has been under U.S. domination since 1898. Many Puerto Ricans, by way of United States policies and economic policies that the United States fostered and promoted, migrated out of Puerto Rico into the 50 states. And they migrated here under incredible con hard conditions. I'm a Puerto Rican man in the United States. I was picked up by the police twice. I remembered what it felt like having my nephew watch me being stopped for no justification. Damn it, I had shorts on, sneakers, tank top, a basketball under my arm. I had just eaten bacalao. Do you know what bacalao is? Bacalao is like pungent with onions and they claimed that I was smoking pot on a street corner. That's why they stopped me. The stereotypes, the profiling, really like the excessive policing that exists in urban America exists in so many ways and the devastation stayed with me forever. Puerto Ricans have this distinct um, experience of being colonized by the United States and also citizens of the United States where immigration is not as central to their experience in being here. And thinking about lot other Latin Americans that are coming to the United States where immigration is the issue that they face the most. Those two distinct identities really shapes people's experiences. And I think part of that is what we're seeing and how it's shaping the larger narrative um, within the United States, that there's this idea that criminal justice is not as central to the Latinx experience, which is unequivocally false, right? Because part of the way that immigration comes into place largely is through criminalization. During the 1920s, Mexicans made more than one million border crossings into the United States. The Mexican population of the United States by 1930 um, was about 10% of the entire population of Mexico, about 1.5 million people. The National Origins Act of 1924. It's effectively a whites-only immigration law that restricts about 96% of the open quota slots to Europeans. But there's employers across the Western United States who are saying, we need access to Mexican workers. If you prohibit Mexican workers from coming into the country, what are we gonna do with our farms? What are we gonna do with our railroads? Who's gonna take care of our children? All of that. So they build in an exemption that Mexicans can come and go, enter and exit the country, largely at will. But what starts happening during the 1920s is that it's not that Mexicans are coming and going out of the country, it's that they're settling down in the United States and they're becoming Mexican-Americans. And this creates a new crisis for the white settler state. We never intended for Mexican immigrants to stay. We intended them to come, pick, and go. So they do come to one compromise is the Immigration Act of 1929. This was a law that was created to target Mexican immigrants in particular, to make sure that they went through the official ports of entry and got permission to come into the country so that permission could be revoked at any time. We didn't want to have so many Mexicans here. And if they cross the border unmonitored, they're going to be criminalized. They're going to be turned into felons. Immediately after the passage of this new law, the number of Mexicans being imprisoned in the United States began to skyrocket. By the end of the 1930s, about 44,000 Mexicans had been arrested, tried, convicted, and imprisoned. This was the first surge of Mexican incarceration in the United States and had everything to do with immigration control. And here in the United States, incarceration is one of the leading, strongest pillars of the settler state. It functions to remove people from the land, 
to cage them up, and in fact, to eliminate them from the, the social order. We have something like 2.3 million people incarcerated in cages in the U.S. I want people to understand that when you put someone in jail or prison, you put them in a cage. A cage is made of iron, it's, it, it rusts, it's made of steel, it clangs, uh, and that's what we do to animals. Part of that is taking away the, the simple freedoms, keeping your hair the way you want it, not having any personal expression when it comes to facial hair or, or hair, uh, having them all wear the same clothes, um, and making them stand a certain way when they address a guard, right, your hands behind your back, uh, always adopting a subservient pose. Prison is uh, long, long periods of lonely despair, uh, interspersed or broken up by Mary B. small cities of terror. What it is is you get dehumanized. It's just a constant wearing down of the individual. You end up questioning yourself, telling them yourself, I deserve this. I am the piece of shit that they're telling me I am. And that ends up transferring itself to whatever interactions you have when you get out. And you have to constantly fight that. I was born in the Panhandle of Texas. My father was a farmer. My childhood was a normal Chicano Mexican American childhood, right? Living in the fields with my family, working like Cosecha, going to school, fighting with the white folks, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, until I turned about 15 or 16, then things kind of changed. Um, one of the things that I just started admitting to the last few years, I wondered what set me on this path was the fact that before I went to prison the first time, I was thrown in jail for drinking while VWI, back when it was legal, actually, driving while drinking. And I mouthed off to the cop and I was thrown into a county jail, into a tank full of men, grown men who'd been convicted and were waiting to go to prison as opposed to city jail. Uh, I was raped pretty brutally all night. Um, they let me go the next day and two weeks later I walked into a fast food joint and robbed in a, this Odyssey prison. It took me a long time to come to terms with that. The country's insatiable appetite to continue to punish people is also a form of social control. And social control exists for multiple reasons, not the least of which is to marginalize people, not the least of which is to actually control their behavior. Um, in 1855, California enacted what is called the Greaser Act. This law was a way of racially profiling Mexicans, people of Latin American origin, in ways that allowed law enforcement to control that population. Racial profiling itself is inherently reflective of what people's perceptions are of Latinos in general. Hollywood films pushed this idea that Latinos were a criminally prone population. This idea of the bandido, the criminal Mexican, was also part of the narrative that these people who were resisting and in their own uh, communities were, were trying to maintain their own land and territory and property, that these were a criminal elements. Very similar to how uh, Native Americans were looked at as fierce savages. What Hollywood's done is to reduce an entire culture to one thing, criminality. In the city of Los Angeles, by the 1940s, young Mexican-American wore zoot suits. It was a way of trying to find their own sense of self and identity at a time when they were marginalized in a city that was once part of Mexico. And it was difficult for them to even walk from downtown into white neighborhoods, white areas of town. People choose to dress in distinctive ways because it's a countercultural 
a movement is to show that they're no longer invisible. When kids themselves feel like they have no self-identity in the community because it's stigmatized, it's demonized, they're going to still wear it as a form of rebellion because if society doesn't care about them, they're not going to compromise their identity to make them happy. They're not. They're already marginal themselves. They don't even have to wear clothes. Their colors of their skins, their haircuts, their walk, their nonverbal communication, all these cues are also going to be used against them as them being gang members. In many ways, that trajectory between bandidos and that stereotype, vagrancy laws that happened in California, the entire way, the way the entire Zoot Suit riots actually occurred as a way to protect the community from, being, from abuse from, in that case, naval forces who are on leave, all these issues feed into a bigger stereotype of criminality among all of us. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Right after um, Nixon declares the first iteration of the war on drugs With the signing of this in bill, New York, Nelson Rockefeller created these mandatory minimums for drug possession, the Rockefeller drug laws, which carried 12 to life sentences for simple drug possession. The new law is tough. There will be no reduced or suspended sentences, and persons serving less than a life term will get no parole. People don't realize that when we talk about drugs and we talk about drug wars, they've always been targeted against people that were not white. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. Fast forward 30 years later, we're seeing 30, 40, 45,000 arrests every year. One year, there were more people that got arrested for marijuana possession in 2010, 2011, than can fit in all of Yankee Stadium. 86% black and Latino. The studies are showing, and have been showing consistently over time, that Latinos use illicit drugs and other substances at much lower rates than whites in the United States. We can go back and forth about drug laws if they're neutral. We cannot deny that drug enforcement is never neutral and is based on disrupting and controlling communities of color. The war on drugs, it's a war on Latinas, Latinos. It's a war on people of color. It's a war on immigrants. But we cannot divorce what's happening in the United States what's happening in the entire hemisphere. The war on drugs in the United States is also a war on our gente in Central America. Mexico is el rey de lo on our pueblos of Sud America. There are people and incredible towns throughout the Caribbean. Entre 2006 y 2017 murieron 330,000 personas en México por la guerra contra la droga. Colombia es el rey de la cocaína. We think about places like Colombia and Mexico and seeing the ridiculously high death tolls associated with drug-related violence. The conversation that is missing is the United States export of drug prohibition and how that has created all this violence which has influenced the forced migration patterns out of Latin America into the United States. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. There is a long-standing myth that immigrants come into this country to commit crime. But the data over time show that immigrants actually um, tend to have lower rates of incarceration, lower rates of crime. 
than other groups and U.S. born citizens. We know that when you look at the statistics, the research, it shows that people of color are more likely going to be targeted to go into prison. We already know that's the design. That, that's a fact. I've been pulled over by the police at my university. They look at my embodiment. They look at my presentation of self. They look at my tattoos. They look at the way I dress. And I could have a PhD, a JD, or MD. As long as I look cool, like I do, I'm still going to be called a gang member. And it's funny because they ask me where I'm from. Like, I'll tell you exactly where I'm from. What you're asking me, what gang I'm from? Well, let me answer that. You see that those buildings over there? I hang out with three or more people. We all coexist in a department. It's called the Department of Sociology. So by definition, yeah, I am a gang member. The country views all people in the same way with that quick association of stereotype, that almost like Pavlovian response. You see a Mexicano, he's got to be in a gang. You see a Puerto Rican man, he's got to be in a gang. Today, you see a Salvadoreño, a person from El Salvador, that person has to be in a gang. The gang is MS-13. Those associations are quick to be made, and they become part of an unconscious perception by most America that we are here to commit crime. And that feeds into law enforcement and high criminal justice systems problems. There have been that long narrative of Latino youth being engaged in gang activity, and gang activity in and of itself is oftentimes viewed as a criminal organization. But you can be a gang member, but not necessarily being engaged in, in criminal activity. We're not like everybody else, you know? That's what, that's what was different about us, that we're like the different ones, you know? Like, look, at them, you know look at their hair. Young people being loud, young people gathering in large numbers does not necessarily rise to the level of criminality. The problem here is that the stereotype of a few or a handful that gets put upon an entire race of people. Gang injunction is an extension of the prison system onto the streets. What they do is that it gives permission to local law enforcement to go into this neighborhood that's already deemed problematic and has an injunction, so that this is like this annotation that it's dangerous. Um, and they can come and question anybody in the neighborhood. So people that say that it's not a big deal to have gang injunction, it is a big deal when it's destroying families, when the whole community is seen as suspect, when there's 24-7 surveillance on the community. Gang injunctions are like a blanket uh, put on a neighborhood. Anybody in that community can be a target, and it's excused because they're suspected to be gang members. So it really gives law enforcement this excessive amount of power um, an excuse to violate somebody's constitutional rights. When my hometown, Santa Barbara, got hit with a gang injunction, we had to fight it through a legal avenue, through public opinion, through the media, and then through community organizing. So empowering the community to stand up and say, no, we don't need this. And after four years of fighting that injunction, amazing uh, community members, families, and our um, and the legal team, uh, that injunction was defeated. So it was one. It was it was it was one at the state level. By the time I was 12, I got into a fight at my middle school. 
And I was charged for assault, and I got on probation when I was 12 years old. I saw myself as a troubled person. I often ask, why can't I just follow the rules? Uh, or why am I so angry? Within those years that I was on probation, uh, I had a social worker assigned to my case at the age of 12. Um, so she was very understanding and uh, was so supportive of my family, not just me, but my mother. And I had a probation officer that was very invested in providing services to get me out of the system, not to keep me stuck in the system and this revolving door. And so I wanted to ensure that the services that were provided to me, the support that was provided to me, that I was able to pay that forward to somebody else. Uh, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but also like looking at it in a systemic and policy frame. It is not just simply that the United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the entire world, but it's that African Americans, along with Latinos, now make up the population that is subject to mass incarceration. The police enacted broken windows policing. They used stop and frisk. They increased their interactions with people, specifically communities of color. The policy of stop, question, and frisk allows police officers to stop and search anyone acting suspiciously. And the way stop and frisk was enforced was that they primarily focused on black and Latino people. Between 2004 and 2012, there were 4.43 million stops. 52% were black suspects, 31% were Hispanic. And so if the kid had a baggie in their pocket, which in their pocket is a $100 ticket, in the course of a stop and frisk arrest, once they pull out that marijuana and put it in plain view, that is an arrestable misdemeanor. And you have nearly 800,000 people that have been arrested for simple marijuana possession just in New York City in the last 20 years. You don't get to mass incarceration without there being a policy said or unsaid that includes racial profiling. You could get these young officers who think, my job is to just throw people in jail. They're a bad guy that committed a crime, I throw them in jail. That's my part, let the courts take care of the rest, let the prison system figure it out. That's not my job as a cop, but it, it's much more complex than that. If we want to break through issues of implicit bias in the police force, there's got to be a better way to think about relating to the community and protecting that community and engaging in um, legitimate law enforcement activities um, that does not perceive communities as being uh, criminally prone and engaged in criminal conduct from the, as, as a starting point. You know, police officers go to certain neighborhoods and break up underage drinking and call parents, or they go to parties that have underage drinking, and they arrest kids. So how do we work with law enforcement to do more of the former than the latter? And how do we make sure that the former is expanded to communities that look like you and me? I really do think that you can change people's implicit biases that they're not even aware of um, through them interacting and collaborating with those communities. I think that's how people develop the cultural competency and, and, and put away those stereotypes that maybe they were brought up. But until you feel it here, you know, in the corazón, this is where the changes is in the heart. When I first got out into our communities back from Dominguez State Jail, I was uh, just naive to what the real impact was going to be until I actually began going out there and looking for work, looking to see how I can make a living, how I can support my child who was three years old, Nicholas, 
you know, all these things. And I wasn't able to. I was very, I was struggling. I was, I couldn't even get a Happy Meal at McDonald's. So, you know, that was a big problem for me. And, and so I, I was just, uh, I was devastated. To me, if somebody's done their time, we gotta, we gotta forgive them on the back end. And if that's not the right thing to do, then we as a community, as a society, need to change our laws and say, well, we're not gonna forgive you. And call, say it, call it what it is, right? We're gonna punish you. And we feel that it's punishment. And don't call it rehabilitation if it's not really that. I'm a self-educated man. Um, ever since I was a child, even when I was homeless, my friends knew me as the professor. So, you know, learning data, uh, I pretty much uh, uh, learned from, uh, from YouTube University, all right? All right, so they're there. Uh, and also going to the library and, and, and learning to how to data mine and do all kinds of stuff. So I taught myself, but I needed to figure out, okay, what do I really want to do with this? And what is it really, how do I use this? So I, I played with it and played with it and played with it. And while I was playing with it, I didn't realize I was actually developing it. In the United States criminal justice systems, it's quite very, very frequent for states to only report out how many people are arrested or imprisoned on parole, on probation, only in black and white and other. They consistently count Latinos as whites. And until we finally fix this data problem, we can't have a full appreciation of how these systems actually hurt Latino populations. We began collecting data, criminal justice history, voter information, we began data mining, and we figured out that we had almost 100,000 justice impacted voters in San Antonio already. We also found out that about 57,000 to 63,000 were active voters. So we started breaking these down by ages, we started breaking them down by gender. In order to study the demographics of the, just the vote, voting patterns of justice impacted people. Organizing criminal justice and, as a Latino isn't easy because our voice isn't as loud as others. Our historical struggles are not considered to be a part of the discussion. And a lot of times you put a lot of effort and energy showing up to these policy meetings and advocating and visiting people and you feel like nothing's happening. One time, I was at the point where I was going to just give up. But you want someone to be strong, and you want someone not to give up, and you want something to be a leader, then you have got to be those things too. And sometimes we, we get to the point where we're just like, enough's enough, I'm tired of it. But that's the test. But that um, we don't give up. So I don't give up. How can we change the culture of a punishment industry? We can't do it by ourselves as Latinas and Latinos. Nor can the black community do it by itself. It needs the incredible solidarity among all groups that actually experience the magnitude of imprisonment in the United States. I want people to understand that it's something systemic that we gotta fight against. We gotta abolish all prisons, especially when we know that that justice means just us, that we gotta change that. We need to change or we're gonna just continue making the same mistakes we've had in the past. We just gotta start listening to each other. But we cannot allow this discussion to be limited in a way that completely erases decades, decades, of policies that were directed against Latinos because of who we are. Yeah.